two claps. Ready, ready? We're with Coach John B. and the Ready Ready Podcast. Remember, I'm going to always believe in you so you can believe in yourself. And I got my man Sterling Moore. Two claps. Ready, ready? Sterling, welcome. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Man, let me tell you about Sterling here now. He went to Deer Valley High School in Antioch. Didn't play much football, right? You're really a baseball, basketball player. Right, correct. Then he went to the senior year. Right. Then he went to the rival JC. And we was at the rival JC, like I tell him, and he was all my receiver's highlights. <laughs> and the next thing you know, he shows up at spring ball late. Now, like, Sterling, why'd you leave LMC? I need a highlight guy. And I was busting his balls a little bit, but really, he came to play. And I think it's a great story because at Laney, he had one year to play. You didn't start early on. You were playing a little bit of nickel. And then you just kept getting better and better and better. And by the end of the season, you were covering the other team's best player. Is that about right? Yep, that's the way it went. So why did it take you so long uh, to get involved with football in high school? For me, I was, I was very undersized. I mean, I'm, I'm very young for my grade. I, I really should have graduated a year later. So, you know, it took, it took me a while to grow and kind of, you know, get to that stature where I felt like I, I was able to play with guys, you know, that, that I, in the grade that I was in, which were really a year older than me. So, uh, you know, it, it was kind of a little bit of that. Now, what was your best sport in high school? Since you played football your senior year, were you a better baseball or basketball player? Uh, I was probably a better baseball player. That's what I heard. I did hear that. It was kind of interesting, right? So you go to, you go, you come here to Laney. We have a good team and you do really, really well. And now I remember trying to get you a scholarship and it was like, we were down to like Stony Brook. And Cal Poly at one point, correct? Is that about no, right? No, it was between Eastern Michigan and UMass and then Hofstra. Right. That's right, Hofstra. That's what it was. And then I went to the convention, and June Jones had just gotten the uh, head job at SMU, and I met with June and his staff, and I said, look, I've got this corner. you got, you got you got to see. This guy can play. And they go, well, Coach, you know, this isn't Hawaii. This is SMU. they got to have great grades. I go, hey. This kid has phenomenal grades. And literally, back then, I carried a VHS tape. <laughs> and I gave them your tape. And within an hour, they called me back and wanted to set up a trip with you. That's how impressive your highlight was here at Laney. Tell me about your first day at SMU. How was it? It was a culture shock. It was a culture shock like none other. I mean, coming from coming from the Bay Area, you know, always being at big schools, you know, uh, SMU is a small school. It's a very, it's a you know private school, and it was it was just very different. It wasn't it wasn't the the athletes running the campus, you know. It was so it, it was very different. And I mean, obviously the weather was it was hot, it was humid. I, we had never done I ne you know it's, it's high seventies in Oakland, you know, going there was one oh five humid. You on the turf in the afternoon, man. It, I'm not gonna lie, there were some days where I was like, yo, I'm ready, I'm ready to call it. I'm ready to go back to Cali. Really? Because I know we had talked and you never you never voiced that concern to me. That's for sure. And no, I mean, it, it you know, it crossed my mind. It really just during the workouts, those mid, the midsummer workouts. I mean, there's days where you just you like, man, I don't know. I don't know if this is it. But no. right. Because when I got back from the convention, which had been middle of January, like around the 10th of 12th, they offered you took a trip and they offered you right away. So you were there by like middle of like January, third week in January. Correct. No, nah, uh, yeah, for my trip, yeah, and it was uh, it was so last minute because UMass was on a quarter system. I was actually committed to UMass and had to be there in two weeks. So Correct. It, you know, it was so last minute that you know it was either I'm gonna get this offer from SMU and I'm gonna commit, or I'll be at UMass in two weeks. Yeah, and at the time, UMass was still one double A. They're making that move to Division One. Correct. Yeah, that's what I thought. Now you get to SMU, you deal with the humidity, you deal with the heat. And you really start taking off as a player your first year there as a junior, correct? I uh, I was supposed to start as a nickel, uh, and then our starting corner went down with food poison or something the first game, and I went out there and had a had an interception and a, and a strip uh, force fumble to seal the game, and from there I was starting. It was over. <laughs> That's why I tell everybody don't don't be Wally Pip, right? That's the guy that stepped down for uh, Joe DiMaggio because you may never get your spot back. That's exactly right. So. You have a good junior year. Tell us about your senior year at SMU. There was some kind of things that occurred. 
So, I mean, I, I had a knee injury and that, I mean, really, really hindered my senior. I think I missed five games, five out of the 10, five out of the 11. And it was just one of those things. I was going back and forth. We were going back and forth. Should I medical, you know, and we knew we had a good team and we were competing to be in the conference championship. We ended up going to the conference championship. It was one of those things where it was like, I wanted to be out there. Um, I wanted to, you know, go to the conference championship. We'd obviously turn, turn the program around at SMU from, you know, the drought that they were in prior to me getting there. Correct. So, um, you know, I kind of fought through that and, and ended up in the conference championship, you know, hurting my knee yet again and then ended up having surgery. So um, it was a rough, it was a rough senior year just with all the rehab and, and, and fighting to get on the field and, and, you know, continuing to be out there. But you never gave up. And here's the beauty of it, right? The NFL went on a strike that year, right? They're in lockout. Man, that was the biggest blessing. Exactly. Because during that time, no one could train. No one was brought to mid. There was no mini camps. There was no camp. Um, and I remember we were talking and you were getting healthy and I had, I was working with the Raiders at that time. And I remember telling the guy, look, if you just got to bring some bodies in, you know, I got a guy and, it, and they already knew who you were being a local guy and you got invited to the Raider camp. Tell us about the Raiders camp. Yeah. I mean, it was one of those things they had drafted two corners in that year's draft, um, you know, pretty early. So it was like, all right, well, in my mind, I kind of get it. I'm, you know, I'm just here to, you know, be legs and and play the fourth quarter, play that fourth preseason game. I, I kind of knew what it was, but when I got there, one of our corners, you know, one of the nickels, he was going through a contract situation, so he really didn't show up at the time. So that was an opportunity to to get on the field. Um, you know, you have your stars who are gonna, you know, only do a couple reps. Sometimes they're gonna take days off, vet days. I, I looked at that as an opportunity. And then one of the guys that got drafted ended up getting hurt. Um, the first preseason game, I believe. And that kind of elevated me. And, and once I, I balled out in that first preseason game and, you know, from there, I was kind of like, oh, I'm not, a, I, I don't look at myself as a camp body no more. Uh, you know, guys on the team could kind of see that, oh, this guy can play the vets, you know, they started to show a little bit more respect. So, um, you know, but it was one of those things. That's the biggest thing when you go from college to the NFL is you can be the man at your college, but you're going to be last on the totem pole in the NFL. And that's the hardest pill to swallow sometimes is that you're not getting on the field right away. You know, you know, you can go out there and compete, but that's just the way the business is. Well, I know I was talking with the DC at the time, right? And we had a lot of long conversations about you and they're really impressed with what you did. And you make the, the long story short is you make the team, but as a practice squad player. And, you know, and I think a lot of people thought you should have made it as a, as on the actually 53, but that's okay. You're, you're, you're in the building. That's the key, right? You're in the building. And, and I remember that you had this great, you know, work ethic always have, and now you're on the team. They get, I think in week two or three, they had some injuries. The DC at the time tells me, Hey, look, we're going to activate Sterling. And I go, and I remember saying, Hey, Sterling, you don't be surprised. You're going to activate it, brother. And then what really happened? They ended up calling me and releasing me. I thought they was calling me to activate me and they called me to release exactly. me. So. Which is just weird because the DC said the same thing. He's like, I can't believe we just released your guy. And, 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 you know, and that's the nature of the business, right? Between the coaching staff and personnel. And in, in this case, the Raiders, the owner, you know, Mr. Davis had his own pick, right? And you get released. But what happens once you got released? Literally that same week, the uh, the Patriots were flying out to play San Francisco, you know, back when they were still in San Francisco and happened to work me out at San Jose State uh, Friday. They flew in town cross country, so they flew a day early instead of Saturday through Friday, worked me out on Saturday, and then I ended up flying back. You know, they said they wanted to sign me to their practice squad, and I ended up flying back after their game uh, and signing with them. So it was a blessing. And that's what I tell people, right? Like I said, I'm always going to believe in you so you can believe in yourself because you never know what's going to happen. The one thing that Sterling, that, that, and I t I've told you over and over again, is that your work ethic and you never gave up on yourself, right? Here's the other thing people don't understand is how smart you are. Because remember, you've been a corner, some nickel back a corner. The Raiders had you as a corner. But what happened? What did, what did Bill Belichick do to you when you first got to uh, New England? Moved me to free safety. And I know you and I had these conversations like, coach, man, I'm not a safety. I'm a, I'm a corner. And what did I say? You're whatever you get on the field at, right? <laughs> exactly what happened. Yep. And now talk about the Patriots when you were there that first year. I mean, uh, you talk about another culture shock, like California, Texas, and now being up north in, in, in New England and Foxborough and 
and that culture complete different than June Jones at, at SMU. Complete opposite. <laughs> you know, it's it's more that military, you're all by the book um, organization. And, you know, obviously they've had success in winning and, and you can't complain about that. But it was such a shock for me. I mean, it, it took me, it, it, it took me probably six weeks to be like, all right, settle in and figure out what you can and can't do. Because it, again, it was just complete difference than, than SMU. And obviously a complete different organization than the Oakland Raiders are, or Oakland at the time, but the Raiders were at the time. So um, it's, it, it was a culture shock. And it was one of those things, again, where I'm questioning like, man, I, I know this, this can't be the league. You know, this can't be what it's about. You're supposed to, I'm a grown man. I'm supposed to be able to do whatever I want to do. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, uh, but it, but it was good. It was good. So playing for John Beam at Laney didn't prepare you for Belichick? As much as I want to say it did, it did. <laughs> it did. All, right, all right, all right. I hear it. So <clears throat> this is my highlight. You go from a free agent, not drafted, being cut. I mean, making practice all, but being cut, picked up by a world champion team, right? The, the, um, the Patriots. Playing safety, totally new position. But by the end of the season, where were you at, baby? Tell everybody. Oh, back at corner, baby. <laughs> That's right. Starting in the Super Bowl. Yep. Now, you think, I want everybody to think about this journey. This is a guy that played one year of high school football. Had to go to junior college. Had no Division One offers, really, at the time. And then ended up with one to SMU. Gets hurt his senior year, thinking that your career is probably over. Never gives up on himself keeps battling, makes it in the NFL to camp, which is for a lot of people that to, I would say, Hey, that's a great highlight. If it ended that, if your story ended right there, what a great story, right? But no, you make the practice squad and then you get released. Next thing you know, by the end of the season, as a true rookie, a free agent rookie, you're starting in the Super Bowl. What a tremendous accomplishment. How many years did you play in the NFL? Seven, seven years. You played for some great teams, right? I mean, you played for Belichick. You were at Dallas. Who was the head coach at Dallas when you were there? Gary. Okay. And then you played at Tampa. Who was the head coach then? Lovey Smith. Lovey. Another great coach, right? Played at New Orleans with my man, Sean Payton. That's right, right? And had played a great career. Now, football is over. For we say, I tell everybody, right? Football's got a shelf life. It's like the milk, right? In the refrigerator, it expires. So when your shelf life ended, what have you been doing for the next last couple of years? Man, I mean, you know, obviously I took some time, took probably two years, year and a half, two years to just decompress, chill, let the body relax, you know, picked up golf, little hobbies here and there. Um, but I knew I always wanted to be in sports somehow, some way, because I initially went to SMU, you know, to be a, to be an agent. And, uh, you know, obviously nowadays everybody's an agent. Everyone gets into that. <laughs> I mean, that's, I'm kind of out. Once I kind of saw the business, I was out on that, but you know, as of, as of this year, I've been, I've been back with the saints on the coaching side. And I mean, that's, it's been amazing. I mean, just being in a, in a good organization with a good staff, with a good, with a good GM, you know, with, with, with talent, you know, they've had the most wins since 2016, 2017, something like that in the NFL. So uh, being with an organization like that, with coaches like that, coaching staff has been has been awesome to learn from, you know, for the most part. It's just a different type of learning than than, than the player. Well, yeah, and I, I want to say that, you know, um, and I know Sean, I've, I've known Sean since he was 27 years old. So when he first started coaching, right, and to watch this rise, that he's a quality young uh, young man, not a young man now, but when I first met him. But I think you, you're you just like him, right? A hard worker, real intelligent, you know, a scrapper, a scraper, man. I think that, that the two of you are going to be great combination. Um, but I got to tell everybody, I've been watching you on social media, and I got to tell you, I love your golf game. You can really hit that thing. If nothing else, maybe you can go in the line drive, uh, the longest drive contest, right? Yeah, I mean that that was one of those things that I missed when I left was the competitiveness. You know, like as a as an athlete, as a competitor, that's something that you always gonna have inside of you, and and that's what you know me picking up golf was was just I was I went out there and I first played, and it was guys out there that looked so unathletic that looked like they had no business out there doing anything athletic. 
and then would just beat me down. And I, and I put my nose down and I was like, nah, I ain't gonna let this happen. I'm not letting this happen. Like I, I'm too good of an athlete to let this happen. And that's kind of, you know, I, I put my, I just put the best foot forward and it's been, it's been great. I love it so far. That's what I'm telling you. That's that Laney built, man. We, we think we could do everything good. Now, exactly. Now, now that you're coaching though in the NFL, how much time do you have to play golf? Man, I might have, might have a Friday afternoon and that's it. Might have. Might, might, might. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Not like the time you had as a player, huh? Oh, no. <laughs> Welcome to the coaching side, right? Yep. All right. So, you know, we've had this great career. You've been around a lot of organizations, been around the NFL. Um, and, you know, you're from the Bay Area. And so now I just want to bring back the Raider organization a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about the Raider. Obviously, they're in the news right now with Coach Gruden. Now, you never played for Gruden, correct? No. What do you think about what's going on with Gruden and the things that have come out in the NFL as a player, as now as a coach, but more importantly as a black man in America? How's all this make you feel or what's what's your thinking, the thought process now with going on with all this? As a player, I mean, as a player and a coach, just, you know, obviously just being a first year coach, it kind of, it's kind of the same thing. It's like, I don't know how you discriminate against a race that in essence is 85% of your team. You know what I'm saying? If that, if that makes sense, like you go out, you basically built your entire coaching career and your legacy off of black men, you know, or off of, off of minorities, whether that's, you know, LGBT, LGBT community, whether that's, they're a minority, whether, you know, no matter what. So you built your legacy and, you know, who you are, your reputation off of minorities. So for you to, you know, kind of backdoor minorities and, you know, bash them or talk about them in a bad way is just, it was a little eye opening, but at the same time, you know, you, you know it's there. You know it's there regardless. And now, obviously, people don't speak like that most of the time. Co- coaches aren't going to speak like that, you know, to somebody's face. And 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 that's the troubling part is like you want me to respect you as a coach, and, and you know you're speaking bad behind our backs, but to our face, you, you know, you're saying you love us and you know you want the best for us, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, it's tough. It's it, it, it's one of those things that you, you just. You didn't see coming. You didn't see coming. Uh, So you're surprised by it because it's Gruden? Are you surprised that people really say that? Or are you not surprised that those type of conversations happen in the NFL? I'm not surprised that those type of conversations happen uh, just because it's such such a business. It's such a a money-driven, you know, you know those conversations are happening. People are being degraded and things like that. But for it to get to that extent uh, was a little shocking. You know, especially especially when you've had to, you know, Gruden's had to work with these people before. You know, it's like you you've had interactions with these people, so it's like you you're kind of two faced. You know, because I know you're not saying that to their face, and you know, you, I know you're not saying you even have an issue with this person to their face. So he he talked about Eric Reed, right? Now, do you know Eric at all? Have you had? I don't know personally. Passed, you guys never passed cross, so you know he took a stand with Colin Kaepernick, right? And, you know, now he's, you know, he's blackballed in essence from the, the league as well um, for that stand. Do you think that more players in the NFL should make that stand publicly? Or do you think they're afraid to, especially after hearing what came out of Coach Gruden, Bruce Allen, who was, a, you know, president, GM of, a, of the, the Redskins or the Washington team, football team. Are you think people are more worried about that or, or not? I'm just curious. No, I think, I think people are scared to, to, you know, voice their stance and voice their opinion because unless you're just a top five guy on your team, you know, you're kind of expendable. And that's just the way the league is. You know, they, they, they'll get rid, they can get rid of you at any moment. And they, and in, in all honesty, they're trying to look forward to get rid of you, you know, to find someone cheaper, to find someone younger, to find someone faster. So they're already looking for a reason. You know, and for most guys, that's their livelihood. You know, they taking care of more than just themselves. So it's like they can't risk, you know, coming out and, you know, voicing their opinion that, you know, that, you know, you've seen owners, you know, the the Texans owner, you know, with, with what he said, you, you've you seen that those type of situations yeah, yeah, absolutely. where owners, you know, have been vocal about 
you know, those stances. So, um, and, and, and you also look long-term like, okay, maybe my coach now there or the team that I'm on now is okay with it. But at some point this contract's going to be over and I'm going to have to move on. And, you know, are these conversations going to be come up as like a stain on my character because I voiced an opinion on, on something in, in another owner and another coach, another GM's mind. Now, the NBA is very vocal, very political, right? You know, LeBron has really stepped, you know, stepped up and, you know, for social justice. Is it easier for an NBA player than it is for an NFL player to stand up for social justice? It, I think it is. You know, they're I, – I don't want to say it's harder to make it to the NFL, but it's definitely harder to sustain it, you know, if, if that makes sense. And, you know, there's 12 guys – 12, 15 guys on a basketball team. There's, you know, 53 plus practice squad. So again, they're they're trying to get rid of you. And the longevity, guys are playing, you play basketball 15, 20 years. You know, that's you're playing football majority of three, three years. So, 2.4. Yeah. So it's like, and again, contracts are guaranteed. So I can say in basketball, I can say whatever I want to say. If you if you have an issue and you release me, you still have to play me my whole contract. It's it's not the same way in football. So let me ask you this, right? Okay. In the NFL, right, out of a 53-man roster, probably the top 10 players on every roster are kind of not expendable, but the next 40, there's there's guys on the street are pretty close to those guys. Is that an accurate statement, do you think? Yeah, I, would, I mean, I'd maybe say top 15 guys on the team. But, okay. But, but, yeah, okay. but, yeah, that's – they're always evaluating, especially the, those, those next 35 guys or whatever they're – they're evaluating the talent that's out there. I mean, literally, there there's workouts. Every team is every Tuesday, guys to work out every Tuesday. Every Tuesday, right? So, you know, and I, and I think that's where people kind of don't understand the, the business of it. Is like they're they're constantly trying to find a better option. Okay. okay. Either whether that's financially, whether that's your play on the field, whether you know anything like that. So, you know, yeah. What do you think the conversation is going to be in your locker room when you guys come back off the bye? Will, will that be a conversation in the locker room among the players? I know you're not a player anymore. You're a coach. But do you think this conversation is going to be out there right now? Um, I, I think it will be. Um, and I'm not sure if there's guys on our team or not that, you know, have played for him. You know, I'm sure if there is, you know, guys are going to have questions for that player. Um, but – yeah, it's definitely going to be talked about. I mean, it is what it is. It's a hot topic. Okay, so let's go back to your time with, with New England. And I know you're a rookie. You know, you only played there when you're, your first years. But with Tom Brady being the face of the franchise, does Tom Brady need to step up in that locker room and say something about it? Or does Tom Brady just like, hey, that's their problem. It's only what we need to do right now. I think, that, I, I think that's a message um, – going to be a message for a lot of teams to be honest with you we're good whether that was then or whether that's now it's you know we can only control what we can control in this locker room in this organization um you know i'm and obviously that that's that's from team to team or or whatever okay. the case would be but i think that you know there's going to be an open conversation about it. i think most teams will have a conversation about it um whether that's the head coach brings it up in the team meeting room um whatever the case may be so uh, it, it's, it has to be talked about. I mean, in, in this day and age, it's going to have to be addressed uh, from team to team, especially with the NFLPA. You know, they usually they come around every year. And, and you know, DeMora Smith is, is, is in every building um, at some point throughout the year. Uh, and, you know, I know to this point that he hasn't come to, to, to our facility yet. So, you know, I think I, don't, I, I won't be in that, you know, that, that players meeting with the NFLPA, but – you know, I'm sure it'll be addressed there as well. Um, so it, it, there's going to be some things that need to be answered, and and um, you know, hopefully the players and everyone else gets their answers. Is it tough right now for you? Like, what locker room you go to? Right, you got the coach's locker room, you got the players. Locker room. Like, where, where do you go? go? You know, like it's, it, I would say it's, the, it's, it's, it's not the locker room. It's when I'm in the cafeteria. It's like you know, there's guys okay. on the team that I played with that I'm like, ah. I, I feel like I can still sit at that table, but then I want to go sit at the coach's table too. So, yeah, that's kind of where the divide is right there in the cafeteria. What's so you can't go to that ta- you can't go to that table and start talking shit, huh? You yeah, get some money going, get get a money bet going right now. 
<laughs> yeah, I can't. Uh, I try to limit myself to, you know, what table I say. I try to say the coaches at the scouts table as much as possible. Okay. But right. I do find myself sometimes sitting there with the players, you know, especially guys. We have a couple guys who went to SMU, you know, there. I'll go sit with them just because okay. I know them. But yeah, I try to I try to stick with the coaches table as much as possible. Now, how's my boy CJ? Is my boy CJ t- take care of you? I love CJ, man. CJ's a good dude, bro. Like, and that's and that as as being on the DB side, seeing his competitiveness for his players and for his group, you know, kind of brings it out of out of you as a as a coach, you know, you know, as a DB coach to like, man, I can't let CJ bring more energy than us. We can't have that because CJ gonna bring the energy over there. He gonna get his guys right. So C- CJ for all of you is is Curtis Johnson. He's a wide receiver coach at uh, uh, New Orleans. He was a uh, before that, he was the head coach at Tulane. But I've known CJ back when he started. Him and Sean both started 20-year-old coaches at San Diego State. He has, he does bring energy, don't he? Talks a hell of a lot of shit, don't he? <laughs> Time. Good, good. So, all right. So, you're gonna stay in coaching. I got, I got this. You know, I, I just know you are. So, you're gonna make a head coach. Who, what head coach, are you gonna? try to pattern yourself out of all the guys that you've been around, who would you pattern yourself out? Or would you think that you'd like to pattern yourself out of? Uh, man, that's, that's a good question. Uh, I, I definitely have to pull from Sean, Coach Payton, um, but I can't discredit, and, I, and, I, and even though it was a culture shock for me, and sometimes I didn't agree with some things, I would have to take some things from Belichick. I mean, just the success that he's had, um, it is one of those things is it's unmatched, you know, it's arguably okay. one of the greatest coaches. So a fusion between those guys, a fusion between being a, a true players coach and a fusion between, you know, that hard nose, you know, we don't care. It's all, it's all about this building, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it'll have to be somewhere between it. But, but the key with that is, you know, having good assistant coaches, you know what I'm saying? That they can pick up kind of where you lack. You know, whether, okay, if you're going to be a hard-nosed guy, you can't have a, a, a staff full of hard-nosed guys. Or you're going to be a player's coach, you can't have a staff full of player's coaches. So I think that's kind of what I've noticed more so is there's that, you know, that ebb and flow of coaches where it's like, all right, you got your high coaches, you got your low coaches, you know, you got your coach that's going to bring energy, you got your coach that's kind of more mellow, subdued. And, you know, I think that's what building, what I've seen so far building a good staff is, is just having that, those coaches that that complement each other. Okay, so so where's Coach Beam at in this? He's, he you're not gonna take anything from Coach Beam to make the, make you a, a, you know your the next Sterling boy. I tell you what, I'm not gonna coach. take is me running them 300 yard track runs. <laughs> <laughs> Did they get you in shape? Yeah, but I didn't even make. I, I I don't know how many we had to run the first time, but I didn't make all of them. I, I crashed out after like the first three. I was like, yo, I can't make. And there was look, there was college. Scouts out there too. I said, I don't care. My back, I can't do it. I locked up. I ain't doing this. <laughs> Man, CJ, CJ couldn't make him either. When when CJ played at Anderson, he came out as a freshman. He tried to hit him. Man, that boy was puking. Now his sophomore year, he did, and because he led the state in rushing. But hey, man, that that's that. I run those to see what type of heart you got, right? Because that's what it's all at. Because you got heart, you gonna finish. If you don't, then we got to work on it, right? That's kind of a, a, an interesting thing. Look, I really appreciate you taking the time to come spend some with me. You're one of my favorite players of all time, but mainly I love you and I, have, we've stayed in touch this whole time. We always talk about different things and you know that you're honest about your feelings, about what's going on. And you're a thinker, you know, you, you know, you never took anything for granted, but you thought your way out of, you know, where I should be, what team would be the best fit for me. What do I have to do? And I think if anybody could, if, if young players want to mimic something about Sterling Moore, it's that you used your head, not as a hitting object, right? But to stay in the game for a long time and to take care of yourself after the game. And maybe that's another talk at another podcast. We'll talk about, you know, life after football, putting yourself in a position to win off the field as well as on the field. Sterling, I really appreciate you coming out. I want to thank everybody for joining me with the Coach John Bean Ready Ready podcast. Remember, I'm always going to believe in you so you can believe in yourself. And Sterling Moore, I believe in you that you're going to make a great NFL coach, brother. Thanks for having me. All right. Two claps. Ready, ready? Sterling, take care. Make sure you tell Sean I said what's up. And 
When you make it to the Super Bowl, remember, you bring me out. Every time I come out, you know I'm going to win. So you better tell Sean I need my two tickets, man. I'll make sure two there for you. All right, brother. You take care. Take care of yourself. Bye now. Thanks for watching. And don't forget to comment and to like. And please subscribe. Two claps. Ready, ready?